Miss Sally Let or Miss Sally's Let by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Miss Sally peered sharply at Willard Stanley, first through her rope gold rimmed glasses and then over them. Willard continued to look very innocent. Joyce, Joyce got up abruptly and went out of the room. So you have bought that queer little house with the absurd name, said Miss Sally. You surely don't call Eden an absurd name, protested Willard. I do for a house, particularly such a house as that, Eden. There are no Edens on earth. And what are you going to do with it? Live in it, alone? Miss Sally looked at him suspiciously. No, the truth is, Miss Sally, I'm hoping to be married in the fall, and I want to fix up Eden for my bride. Oh, Miss Sally drew a long breath, partly it seemed of relief and partly of triumph, and looked at Joyce, who had returned, with an expression that said, I told you so, but Joyce, whose eyes were cast down, did not see it, and went on Willard calmly. I want you to help me fix it up, Miss Sally. I don't know much about such things, and you know everything. You will be able to tell me just what to do to make Eden habitable. Miss Sally looked as pleased as she ever allowed herself to look over anything as a man suggested. It was the delight of her heart to plan and decorate and contrive. Her own house was a model of comfort and good taste, and Miss Sally was quite ready for new worlds to conquer. Instantly, Eden assumed importance in her eyes. She might be sorry for the misguided bride who was rashly going to trust her life's keeping to a man, but she would see, at least, that the poor thing should have a decent place to begin her martyr martyrdom in. I'll be pleased to help you all I can, she said graciously. Miss Sally could speak very graciously when she chose, even to men. You would not have thought she hated them, but she did, in all sincerity, too. Also, she had brought her niece up to hate and distrust them, or she tried to do so. But at times, Miss Sally was troubled with an uncomfortable suspicion that Joyce did not hate and distrust men quite as thoroughly as she ought. The suspicion had occurred several times the summer since William Stanley had come to take charge of the biological station at the harbor. Miss Sally did not trust Willard on his own account. She merely distrusted him on principle and on Joyce's account. Nevertheless, she was rather nice to him. Miss Sally, dear, trim, dainty Miss Sally, with her snow-white curls and her big girlish black eyes, couldn't help being nice even to a man. Willard had come a great deal to Miss Sally's. If it were Joyce, he were after Miss Sally blocked his schemes with much enjoyment. He never saw Joyce alone, that Miss Sally knew of, at least, and he did not make much apparent headway. But now all danger was removed, Miss Sally thought. He was going to be married to somebody else, and Joyce was safe. Thank you, said Willard. I'll come up tomorrow afternoon, and you and I will take a prowl about Eden to see what must be done. I'm ever so obliged, Miss Sally. I wonder who is he going to marry, said Miss Sally, careless of grammar, after he had gone. Poor, poor girl. I don't see why you should pity her, said Joyce, not looking up from her embroidery. There was just the nearest tremor in her voice. Miss Sally looked up, looked at her sharply. I pity any woman who is foolish enough to marry. She said solemnly, no man is to be trusted, Joyce, no man. They are all ready to break a trusting woman's heart for the sport of it. Never you allow any man the chance to break yours, Joyce. I shall never consent to your marrying anybody. So mind you, don't take any such notion into your head. There oughtn't be any danger, for I have instilled correct ideas on this subject into you from childhood. But girls are such fools, I know, because I was one myself once. Of course I should... Never marry without your consent, Aunt Sally, said Joyce, smiling faintly but affectionately at her aunt. Joyce loved Miss Sally with her whole heart. Everybody who knew, everybody did who knew her. There never was a more lovable creature than this pretty little old maid who hated the men so bitterly. That's a good girl, said Miss Sally approvingly. I own that. 
I have never been a little afraid that this William Stanley was coming here to see you, but my mind is set at rest on that point now, and I shall help him fix up his dollhouse with a clear conscience, Eden, indeed. Miss Sally sniffed and tripped out of the room to hunt up a furniture catalog. Joyce sighed and let her embroidery slip to the door, to the floor. Oh, I'm afraid Willard's plan won't succeed, she murmured. I'm afraid Aunt Sally will never consent to our marriage, and I can't and won't marry him unless she does. For she would never forgive me, and I couldn't bear that. I wonder what makes her so bitter against men. She is so sweet and loving. It seems simply unnatural that she should have such a feeling so deeply rooted in her. Oh, what will she say when she finds out, dear little Aunt Sally? I couldn't bear to have her angry with me. The next day, Willard came up from the harbor and took Miss Sally down to see Eden. Eden was a tiny, cornery, gabled gray house just across the road and down a long, twisted, windy lane, skirting the edge of a beech wood. Nobody lived in it for years, for four years, and it had a neglected, out of, out of elbow appearance. It's rather a box of a place, isn't it? said Willard slowly. I'm afraid she will think so. But it is all I can afford just now. I dream of, of giving her a, a palace someday, of course. We'll have to begin humbly. Do you think anything can be made of it? Miss Sally was bus busily engaged in sizing up the possibilities of the place. It is pretty small, she said meditatively. And the yard is small too. There are far too many trees and the shrubs all messed up together. They must be thinned out and the paling t taken down. I think a good deal can be done with it. And as for the house, well, let us see the inside. Willard unlocked the door and showed Miss Sally over the place. Miss Sally poked and pried and sniffed and wrinkled her forehead, finally stood on the stairs and delivered her ultimatum. This house can be done up very nicely. Paint and paper will work wonders. I wouldn't paint it outside. Leave it that pretty silver weather gray and plant vines to run over it. Oh, we'll see that we can do. Of course it is small, a kitchen, a dining room, a living room, and two bedrooms. You won't want anything stuffy. You can do the painting yourself and I'll help you hang the paper. How much money can you spend on it? Willard named the sum. It's not a large one, but I think it will do, mused Miss Sally. We'll make it do. There's such satisfaction giving as much as you possibly can out of a dollar and twice as much as anybody else would get. I enjoy that sort of thing. This will be a game and we'll play it with a right good will. But I do wish you would give the place a sensible name. I think Eden is the most appropriate name in the world, laughed Willard. It will be Eden for me when she comes. I suppose you tell her at all that and she believes it, said Miss Sally sarcastically. You'll both find out that there is a good deal more prose than poetry in life. But we'll find it out together, said Willard tenderly. Won't that be worth something, Miss Sally? Prose, rightly written and read, is something t sometimes as beautiful as poetry. Miss Sally deigned no reply. She carefully gathered up her gray silken skirts from the dusty floor and walked out. Got Christina Bowes to come up tomorrow and scrub this place out, she said practically. We can go to town and select paint and paper. I should like the dining room done in pale green and the living room in creamy tones, ranging from white to almost golden brown, but perhaps my taste won't be hers. Oh yes, it will, said Willard with assurance. I am quite certain she will like everything you like. I can never thank you enough for helping me. If you hadn't consented, I should have had to put it into the hands of some outsider whom I couldn't have helped at all, and I wanted to help. I wanted to have a finger in everything because it is for her. You see, Miss Sally, it will be such a delight to fix up this little house, knowing that she is coming to live in it. I wonder if you really mean it, said Miss Sally bitterly. Oh, I dare say, you think you do, but do you? Perhaps you do. Perhaps you are the exception that proves the rule. This was a great admission for Miss Sally to make. For the next two months, Miss Sally was happy. Even Willard himself was not more keenly interested in Eden and his development. Miss Sally did wonders with his money. She was an expert at bargain hunting, and her taste was excellent. 
A score of times, she mercif mercilessly, mercilessly nipped Willard's suggestion in the bud. Lace curtains for the living room. Never. They would be horribly out of place in such a house. You don't want curtains at all. Just a frill is all that quaint window needs. With a shelf above it for a few bits of pottery. I picked up a loaf of a brass platter in town yesterday. Got it for next to nothing when that old Jew would really rather give you a thing than suffer you to escape without taking something. Oh, I know how to manage them. You certainly do, laughed Willard. It amazes me to see how far you can stretch a dollar. Willard did the painting under Miss Sally's watchful eye, and they hung the paper together. Together they made trips to town or junketed over the country in search of furniture and dishes of which Miss Sally had heard. Day by day the little house blossomed into a home, and day by day Miss Sally's interest in it grew. She began to have a personal affection for its quaint rooms and their adornments. Moreover, in spite of herself, she felt a growing interest in Willard's bride. She never told her the name of the girl he hoped to bring to Eden, and Miss Sally never asked it. But he talked of her a great deal, in a shy, reverent, tender way. He certainly seems to be very much in love with her, Miss Sally told Joyce one evening when she returned from Eden. I would believe in him if it were possible for me to believe in a man. Anyway, she will have a dear little home. I've almost come to love that Eden house. Why don't you come down and see it, Joyce? Oh, I'll come someday, I hope, said Joyce lightly. I think I'd rather not see it until it's finished. Willard is a nice boy, said Miss Sally suddenly. I don't think I ever did him justice before. The finer qualities of his character come out in these simple, homely little doings and tasks. He is certainly very thoughtful and kind. Oh, I suppose he'll make a good husband as husbands go. But he doesn't know the first thing about managing if his wife isn't a good manager. I don't know what they'll do, and perhaps she won't like the way we've done up Eden. Willard says she will, of course, because he thinks her perfection. But she may have a dreadful taste and want the lace curtains and that nightmare of a pink rug Willard admired. And I dare say she'd rather have a new flaunting set of china with rosebuds on it than that dear old dull blue I, th I picked up for mere song down at Aldenbury Auction. I stood in the rain for two mortal hours to make sure of it, and it was really worth it what Willard had spent on the dining room put together. It will break my heart if she sets to work altering Eden. It's simply perfect as it is, though I suppose I shouldn't say it. In another week Eden was finished. Miss Sally stood in the tiny hall and looked around her. Well, it is done, she said with a sigh. I'm sorry, I have enjoyed fixing it up tremendously, and now I feel my occupation is gone. I hope you are satisfied, Willard. Satisfied is too mild a word, Miss Sally. I am delighted. I knew you could accomplish wonders, but I never hoped for this. Eden is a dream, the dearest, quaintest, sweetest little home that ever waited for a bride. When I bring her here, oh, Miss Sally, do you know what that thought means to me. Miss Sally looked curiously at the young man. His face was flushed and his voice trembled a little. There was a far away, shining look in his eyes as he saw a vision. I hope you and she will be happy, said Miss Sally slowly. When will she be coming, Willard? The flush went out of Willard's face, leaving it pale and determined. This is for her and you to say, he answered steadily. Me, exclaimed Miss Sally. What have I to do with it? A great deal, for unless you consent, she will never come here at all. Willard Stan Stanley said Miss Sally with ominous calm. Who is the girl you mean to marry? The girl I hope to marry is Joyce. Miss Sally, wait. Don't say anything till you hear me out. He came close to her and caught her hands in a boyish grip. Joyce and I have loved each other ever since we met, but we despaired of winning your consent, and Joyce will not marry me without it. I thought if I could get you help me fix up my little home that you might get so interested in it and so well come acquainted with me that you would trust me with Joyce. Please do, Miss Sally. I love her so truly, and I know I can make her happy. 
if you don't, Eden shall never have a mistress. I'll shut it up just as it is, and leave it sacred with the dead hope of a bride that will never come to it. Oh, you wouldn't, protested Miss Sally. You would, would be a shame, said a dear little house, and after all the trouble I've taken. But you have tricked me. Oh, you men couldn't be straightforward in anything. Wasn't it a fair device for a desperate lover, Miss Sally, interrupted Willard. Oh, you mustn't hold spite because of it, dear. And you'll give me Joyce, won't you? Because if you don't, I really will shut up Eden forever. Miss Sally looked wistfully around her. But the open door on her left, and she saw the little living room with its quaint, comfortable furniture, its dainty pictures and adornments. Through the front door, she saw the trim, velvet, swarded little lawn. Upstairs were two white rooms that only wanted a woman's living presence to make them jewels. In the kitchen on which she had expended so much thought and in ingenuity, the kitchen furnished the last detail, even the kindling in the range and the match Willard had laid ready to light it. It gave Miss Sally a pang to think of that altar fire never being lighted. It was really the thought of the kitchen that finished Miss Sally. You've tricked me, she said again reproachfully. You've tricked me into loving this house so much that I cannot bear the thought of it never living. You'll have to have choice, I suppose, and I believe I'm glad that it isn't a stranger who is the mistress of Eden. Joyce won't hanker after pink rugs and lace curtains, and her taste in China is the same as mine. In one way, it's a great relief to my mind, but it's a fearful risk, a fearful risk, to think that you may make my dear child miserable. You know you don't think that I will, Miss Sally. I'm not really that, such a bad fellow, now am I? You are a man, and I have no confidence whatever in men, declared Miss Sally, wiping some real tears from her eyes with a very unreal sort of handkerchief, one of the cobwebby affairs of lace. Her daintiness demanded, Miss Sally, why have you such a rooted distrust of men, demanded Willard curiously. Somehow it seems so foreign to your character. I suppose you think I am a perfect crank, said Miss Sally, sighing. Well, I'll tell you why I don't trust men. I have a very good reason for it. A man broke my heart and embittered my life. I have never spoken about it to a living soul, but if you want to hear it, you shall. Miss Sally sat down on the second step of the stairs and tucked her wet handkerchief away. She clasped her slender white hands over her knee in spite of her sliv silvery hair and the little lines on her face. She looked girlish and youthful. There was a pink flush on her cheeks, and her big black eyes sparkled with anger her memories aroused in her. I was a young girl of twenty when I met him, she said, and I was just as foolish as all young girls are, foolish and romantic and sentimental. He was very handsome, and I thought him. But there, I won't go into any of that. It vexes me to recall my folly, but I loved him, yes, I did, with all my heart, and with all there was of me to love. He made me love him. He deliberately set himself to win my love. For a whole summer he flirted with me. I didn't know he was flirting. I thought him in earnest. Oh, I was such a little fool and so happy. Then he went away, went away suddenly without even a word of goodbye. He, But he had been summoned home by his father's serious illness, and I thought he would write. I waited, I hoped. I never heard from him, never saw him again. He had tired of his plaything and flung it aside. That is all, concluded Miss Sally passionately. I never trusted any man again. When my sister died and gave me her baby, I determined to bring the dear child up safely. Training her to avoid the danger I had fallen into, well, I failed. But perhaps it will be all right. Perhaps there will be some men who are true. Though Stephen Merritt was false. Stephen who? demanded Willard abruptly. Miss Sally colored. I didn't mean to tell you his name, she said, getting up. It was a slip of the tongue, never mind. Forget it, and him. He was not worthy of remembrance, and yet I do remember him. I can't forget him, and I hate him, all the more for it, for having entered so deeply into my life that I could not cast him out when I knew him unworthy. It is humiliating. There, let us lock up Eden and go home. I suppose you are dying to see Joyce and tell her your precious plot had succeeded. Willard did not appear to be 
at all impatient, he had relapsed into a brown study, during which he let Miss Sally lock up the house. Then he walked silently home with her. Miss Sally was silent too. Perhaps she was repenting her confidence, or perhaps she was thinking of her false lover. There was a pathetic droop in her lips, and her black eyes were sad and dreamy. Miss Sally said Willard at last, as they neared her house. Had Stephen Merritt any sisters? Miss Sally threw him a puzzled glance. He had one, Jean Merritt, whom I disliked and who disliked me. She said crisply, I don't want to talk of her. She was the only woman I ever hated. I never met any of the other members of his family. His home was a distant part of the state. Willard stayed with him so brief a time that Miss Sally viewed his departure with suspicion. This was not very lover-like conduct. I dare say, he's like all the rest. When his aim is attained, the prize loses its value, reflected Miss Sally pessimistically. Poor Joyce, poor child, but there, there is a single inharmonious thing in his house. That is one comfort. I'm so thankful I didn't let Willard buy those brocade chairs he wanted. They would have given Joyce the nightmare. Meanwhile, Willard rushed down to the bi biological station and from there, drove furiously to the station to catch the evening express. He did, did not return until three days later, when he appeared at Miss Sally's dusty and triumphant. Joyce is out, said Miss Sally. I'm glad of it, said Willard recklessly. It's you I want to see, Miss Sally. I have something to show you. I've been all the way home to get it. From his pocketbook, Willard drew something folded and creased and yellow that looked like a letter. He opened it carefully and holding it in his fingers, looked over at Miss Sally. My grandmother's maiden name was Jean Merritt, he said deliberately, and Stephen Merritt was my great uncle. I never saw him, he died when I was a child, but I've heard my father speak of him often. Miss Sally turned very pale. She passed her cobwebby handkerchief across her lips and her hand trembled. Willard went on. My uncle never married. He and his sister Jean lived together until her late marriage. I was not very fond of my grandmother. She was a selfish, domineering woman, very unlike the grandmother of tradition. When she died, everything she possessed came to me, as my father, her only child, was then dead. In looking over a box full of papers, I found a letter, an old love letter. I read it with some interest, wondering whose it could be, and how I came, how I came among grandmother's private letters. It was signed Stephen so that I guess my great uncle had been the writer. But I had no idea who the Sally was to whom it was written until the other day. Then I knew it was you, and I went home to bring you your letter, the letter you should have received long ago. When you did not receive it, I cannot explain. I fear that my grandmother must have been to blame for that. She must have intercepted and kept the letter in order to part her brother with you. And so far as I can wish to repair the wrong she has done you, I know it can never be repaired, but at least I think this letter will take the bitterness out of the memory of your lover. He dropped the letter in Miss Sally's lap and went away. Pale, Miss Sally picked it up and read it. It was from Stephen Merritt's to dear Sally and contained a frank, manly avowal of love. Would she be his wife if she would? Let her write and tell him so. But if she did not and could not love him, let her silence reveal the bitter fact he would wish to spare her the pain of putting her refusal into words. And if she did not write it, he would understand that was she was not for him. When Willard and Joyce came back into the twilight room, they found Miss Sally still sitting by the table, her head leaning pensively on her hand. She had been crying. The cobwebby handkerchief lay beside her, wrecked and ruined forever, but she looked very happy. I wonder if you know what you have done for me, she said to Willard. But no, you can't know. You can't realize it fully. It means everything to me. You have taken away my humiliation and restored to me my pride of womanhood. He really loved me. He was not false. He was what I believed him to be. Nothing else matters to me at all now. Oh, I am very happy, but it would never have been if I had not consented to give you choice. She rose and took their hands to hers, joining them. God bless you, dears, she said softly. I believe you will be happy 
and that your love for each other will always be true and faithful and tender. Willard, I give you, my dear child, in per perfect trust and confidence. With her yellowed love letter clasped to her heart and a rapture shining in her eyes, Miss Sally went out of the room. And that's the end of Miss Sally's Let by uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery. I thought it was a good story, as I always say at the end of these things. I have really poor reading comprehension skills, so I don't really understand what the story was about. Um, I kind of lost track about two paragraphs in. Um, this is why I'm doing this, because I'm trying to get better at reading comprehension. And some, follow, some stories I find I'm able to follow the whole time and understand what they're talking about, but sometimes... Like, my memory is so bad, I just, I completely lose track of what they're talking about. But I think you become more intelligent through reading, and I think I'm going to get better at reading the more I do it. This might seem foolish to create this content like this, but I think I'm going to get better at reading, and eventually I could turn this into a career if I keep doing it. If you can see it, and you believe it, you can achieve it. That's what they say. Let me know in the comments below what do you think of the story, and please subscribe to this channel to be part of the community. Please like this video, it really helps the channel out a lot. As always, thank you for watching. Have a great day.